It's said that a picture is worth a thousand words. Here's a picture of my Aunt Edna. I I'm told there's a resemblance, but I don't see it. Anyway, there's a lot you could say about Edna just from looking at the picture. When you're dealing with the function, there's a lot you can say by looking at the picture. The picture I'm referring to is the graph of the function. By observing the graph, you can understand the properties of the function. Many functions fall into three major categories, linear, quadratic, and exponential. Each of these functions has a graph with its own particular look and set of properties. The graph of a linear equation is easy to understand. The word linear contains the word line, and that's what the graph looks like. It's a line. The property most identifiable is whether the graph is increasing or decreasing. As I move from left to right on this graph, I'm moving upwards. We would say that this line has a positive slope and that the function is increasing. But if the line is sloped in this direction, where I'm moving downwards as I travel from left to right, the line has a negative slope and we would say that the function is decreasing. The graph of a quadratic equation looks a lot different than the graph of a linear equation. The graph of a quadratic equation is always a parabola. As you can see, part of this function is increasing and part of it is decreasing. Now, if you tried to follow this function from left to right, you wouldn't even be able to find a starting point because the parabola goes on infinitely in that direction, up and to the left. As the function decreases, it reaches the point right below me. And at that point, it's not decreasing anymore. Now, once I follow the function past that point, it begins to increase as we follow it from left to right. And it goes off infinitely in that direction, up and to the right. So if I slid down this part of the function, and trust me, I'd injure something if I tried, I would be decreasing until I got to this point. Once I moved to the right of this point and tried to climb this function, also not a good idea, I'd be increasing. But at this point, the point zero, zero, I'm neither climbing up nor sliding down. I'm neither increasing nor decreasing. When we identify the parts of a function that are increasing or decreasing, we reference the points on the x-axis. In other words, what are the x values for the points that make up the increasing interval of the function. Remember, this function doesn't begin increasing until just past zero on the x-axis. So we say it increases when x is greater than zero. Similarly, this function stops decreasing just before zero on the x-axis. So we say it decreases when x is less than zero. And the function is neither increasing nor decreasing at x equals zero. Another property of functions that we can identify is the domain and range. The domain is all the first members of the function's ordered pairs. And the range is made up of all the second members. The domain is made up of x values that we can find along the x-axis. The range is made up of y values that we can find along the y-axis. So, by looking at the x and y values of the graph of the function, we can identify the domain and range. Notice that no matter what x value you choose along the x-axis, there is a corresponding point on the graph. Therefore, every number on the x-axis is a member of the domain. So the domain is all real numbers. However, notice that the graph never dips below the x-axis. No y values are ever less than zero. Therefore, the range is from zero and above along this axis, the y-axis. And we say the range is y is greater than or equal to zero. Since there's a lower limit to this graph, this graph has what is called a minimum. The minimum is the lowest point on a graph. So the lowest point on this graph is down here at the point zero, zero. So the minimum is zero. But if we had a parabola that was turned the other way, 
then this function doesn't have a minimum value, but it does have a maximum value, which is the highest point on a graph. The maximum of this function is 4. We can also talk about the zeros of a function. Those are the points at which the graph crosses the x-axis, sometimes called the x-intercepts. A quadratic function can have no zeros, one zero, or as in this case, two zeros. So for this function, which is y equals negative x squared plus four, the zeros are negative two and two. The zeros are significant because they are the roots of the related quadratic equation, negative x squared plus four equals zero. So it's important that we can identify the zeros. It's also a good idea to be able to identify the y-intercept, the place where the graph intersects the y-axis. Now, a function may have many x-intercepts, but at most, it has one y-intercept. The y-intercept of this graph is 4. Finally, parabolas are symmetric in shape and have an axis of symmetry. That's the vertical line of which each point to the left has a corresponding point to the right. The axis of symmetry for this parabola is the y-axis itself. And generally, you would name the axis by the equation of the vertical line. So in this case, the axis of symmetry is the line x equals 0. The third type of function is an exponential function. An exponential function is unique because it involves asymptotes. An asymptote is a line that a graph approaches but never actually intersects. The graph gets closer and closer to the asymptote, but it never touches it. Here's what I mean. This is the graph of y equals 2 to the x. Notice, as x gets larger, y gets larger. When x equals 0, y equals 1. When x equals 1, y equals 2. x equals 2, y equals 4. As x gets smaller, y also gets smaller. But these y's are decreasing fractions, 1 half, 1 fourth, 1 eighth. And as the y values keep reducing by a factor of 1 half, they get smaller, but they never reach 0, and they never get negative. So the graph gets closer and closer to the x-axis, but it never touches it. The x-axis is an asymptote. So now that we understand the nature of the graph of an exponential function, let's talk about its properties. The x values of this function stretch infinitely in both directions, so the domain is all real numbers. But the y values never reach zero or go below the x-axis, though they do get infinitely larger as the x values increase. So the range of this function is the set of y values that are greater than zero. Since the exponential function is asymptotic to the x-axis, meaning it never touches the x-axis, the function doesn't have any x-intercepts or zeros. However, it does cross the y-axis, so we can indicate that it has a y-intercept of 1. Although it's a curve, this graph is not symmetric, so there's no axis of symmetry. The graph continues to rise infinitely as we go to the right. And the graph gets closer and closer to the axis on the left, but never touches it. So there's never a smallest y value. So this function has neither a maximum nor a minimum. Those y values way over to the left are teeny little fractions. But as we move from left to right, those fractions get larger and larger, and then become larger whole numbers. So this graph is always increasing, or it increases for all real numbers. Finally. When an exponential function increases, we say it demonstrates exponential growth. If the function is decreasing, as in this graph, then it demonstrates exponential decay. This graph is increasing, so it represents exponential growth. There are lots of other functions whose properties we can identify. Here's a graph of an absolute value function, specifically, y equals the absolute value of x minus 4 minus 1. We can identify all the properties. Since the x values can be anywhere on the x-axis, the domain is all real numbers. Since the y values go as low as negative 1, but never any lower, the range consists of all y's greater than or equal to negative 1. <laughs> 
This graph has two x-intercepts, 3 and 5, and a y-intercept of 3. This graph has an axis of symmetry. If you drop a vertical line through the vertex of this graph, you can see that everything to the left of the line is mirrored on the right. The axis of symmetry is that vertical line whose equation is x equals 4. This graph has a part that increases, a part that decreases, and a point that does neither. The graph increases when the x values are greater than 4. The graph decreases when the x values are less than 4. We were able to use a lot of the same ideas about properties from other graphs to help us speak about the absolute value graph. Now here's a graph that looks totally different. Some graphs express real life situations. This is a graph of a long distance calling plan in which the phone company charges 10 cents for the first minute of a call and 5 cents for each minute after that. The minutes are the X values and the cost makes up the Y values. Notice the open circle on the Y axis because at time equals zero, there is no call and no charge. But as soon as the call begins, the customer is charged for the first minute. That amount is the same right up to the one minute mark, and as soon as the call goes over the first minute, the two minute cost kicks in. That happens each successive minute as long as the call lasts. This graph looks different than the other graphs because it has breaks in it which brings up another property of functions, continuity. All the graphs we looked at so far are continuous. They don't have any breaks. If you were drawing these with a pencil, the pencil would never have to leave the paper. But in this function, you would have to draw individual little segments, lifting the pencil each time. A function that has breaks in it is called discontinuous. How about the other properties? The domain of this function is x is greater than zero because there are no negative values for x. You can't have a phone call of negative minutes or even a call with no time at all. The range of this function is made up of individual rational numbers starting at 10 hundredths, which is 10 cents, then increasing by 5 hundredths or 5 cents. This range does go on infinitely even though in reality, a call can't go on forever. Although it might not seem that way if you got on the phone with Aunt Edna. The point is, there's no maximum amount that the phone company will charge. So the range continues on infinitely. That would also mean that there's no maximum in this function, but there is a minimum. That's the least amount you can be charged. And those are the lowest points on the graph, 10 hundredths. There are no intercepts, x or y. The graph never touches the x-axis because there's no call of zero cents. And there's that open circle indicating the graph doesn't touch the y-axis because there's no call that has a time of zero minutes. There's also no axis of symmetry in this graph. That's easy to see but perhaps not as evident is that this graph neither increases nor decreases. The steps have a pattern where they rise as the call continues, but each individual step is horizontal, and a horizontal line is neither increasing nor decreasing. So every function has a graph, and every graph, which is a picture of a function, tells a story. We can identify properties of the function from the graph we can identify the domain and range, pick out the x and y intercepts, tell whether the function has a maximum or minimum, and indicate in which intervals the function is increasing or decreasing. We can find the equation of the axis of symmetry if there is one, and classify the function by its continuity, continuous or discontinuous, and we can do it all with the picture. Bye-bye.